Everybody doing okay? Glad, glad you made it. Oh, wow. Wow. Let there be life. Light, let there be light. Everybody doing all right? Okay, let's see a few thumbs up. Right. Glad you made it. Um, uh, let's see, where are we in our calendar? We are at the 2nd of December. Um, I do have a PowerPoint there, A. Uh, I think I uploaded it there. So. Uh, just real quick, um, uh, you know, I, I just I don't have a bulletin, and my brain is not uh, remembering. But we do have Christmas caroling. Uh, 14. 14? Uh, that's a Monday? No, it's 11. Aaron. Uh, yeah, Aaron, Aaron doesn't remember either, so I don't feel so bad. Something's the 14. Nothing's on the 14th. Um, that is a Monday, um, except for it's the first day of the week for some of you. Uh, the 11th is Hanukkah, and so we are going to be Christmas caroling. So I encourage you to dress warm, come ready, warm up your vocal cords, everybody. Everybody, everybody, vocal cords, la 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 la. Oh, yeah. All right. And we do have a Christmas party on the, I'm taking a good shot in the dark here, the 16th, uh, Wednesday. And so uh, you can get all the details in your bulletin. I think we're, I don't, I don't know exactly what we're going to do, uh, except for I do know we're going to eat. Yay. Um, so uh, it'll start norm, normal time, 7 o'clock. And so I uh, just encourage you to uh, be a part of everything happening. Uh, we do have our Wednesday uh, Wednesday uh, pre pre Christmas uh, service, and um, throughout the the week the, the Sundays this month we're dealing with Advent, and so if you don't know anything about Advent, I want to encourage you to come. I will tell you the definition of Advent is the great anticipation toward a a notable person. So somebody notable is going to be born or was born this month. <laughs> And so uh, we, uh, we are in anticipation for God doing something powerful. Um, how many of you had, a, had an interesting 2020? Uh, you know, uh, aside from the pandemic, um, you know, I, our, we had a pretty good 2020. Um, so, but we are going to have an amazing 2021. And we're going to believe God for... Uh, uh, just to help us, and uh, anyway, those are the announcements. Uh, ushers, come. We're going to uh, take our tithes and offerings. Uh, so I want to encourage you to give. If you're giving online, uh, you give through the Zelle app, and it's uh, ccfc3622 at gmail.com. Father, we are so grateful and thankful for the opportunity to be here tonight to give um, into your kingdom. No, no greater investment can be made and into the souls of people and into the lives of people. And I pray that, Lord, we would each get that, Lord, that spirit of generosity. God, that, that you are so generous in giving your life for us, that we would be generous in giving our lives for others. And I pray that you would continue to help us, build us, God, as a people. We pray. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you give. Uh, this evening, um, <clears throat> one of the things uh, I want to do in 2021 is I want to start a bunch of home groups, small group home groups. We call them soul group, S-O-U-L, sharing our unconditional love, S-O-U-L. And uh, that's just what we call them. Other people call them cell groups, small groups, home groups. Um, but I want to start a bunch of those. Uh, when I say a bunch, I can, we can only start it with it's like, you know, the people that are here. So, um, you know, but, you know, I, I think that uh, we can begin to do this and have greater impact in the communities we live. Uh, people may not come to church, but they may come to your house for dinner. Um, and so I do have a strategy for this. Uh, I've had a strategy for it. It's just hard to get people locked in, locked down, you know. And uh, 
uh, that they're that they're here. Um, you know, one of the things every church needs is dependability. People that are just here that you can go, okay, they're doing it every week or every other or whatever. And so, uh, you know, because we are committed until we die. Right. Amen. Yeah. After that, it's over. Yeah. So, <laughs> when you're dead, when you're dead, you're done. Yeah. Um, and so, until then, until then, um, then let's be committed. Let's be committed to our city. Let's be committed to the people uh, that are here. And so anyway, I do have some thoughts on that. Um, uh, we'll probably gather, uh, have some kind of meeting at the beginning of uh, the year just so we can get this in place and working. Uh, I want, you know, I, just, I'm, I don't want to preach a long time tonight, but I want to talk about um, something that I call the root cause. Um, everybody's looking for the root of the problem. You know, when you're in math, you know, in math, you're looking for the root. You're looking for, because the root will tell you everything. The root will tell you how the problem is put together. And, you know, how many of you uh, in English uh, learned how to diagram sentences? Uh, I can't lift my hand on that. I, uh, I could not diagram sentences, prepositional phrases, verbs, nouns, adverbs, pronouns, um, whatever, I'm sure there's a lot of other parts that I never learned. Uh, but diagramming, what it would do is it would call, it would show you the root. Yeah. Yeah. And it would show you why, it's the same in everything. Words, why they are, you find out, you know, if they're Latin, if whatever they, their origin is. And, and so the root cause of your life. Yeah. You wonder why things are happening the way they are in your life. There are times, uh, not always, because we know that we get blindsided and stuff happens. And, but many times we can go back and look at the root yes. of our life. And one of the things that we try to do as a church, and again, uh, I am praying uh, regarding the church moving forward uh, as a gathering uh, what it is going to look like, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, and so uh, I'm praying about all, although as I'm praying about that, I, I'm thinking too that the root is never jeopardized. Yeah. The, the method, um, the, the outward may change, the appearance may change, but the root is never jeopardized. Yeah. Um, and so, again, you, you, we can do this uh, across the board, from our lives to our marriage to our children to, you know, why are our kids the way they are? Look at how you trained them. Look at the root. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that we can do. Uh, and so th th just this idea is the root cause, and I'm obviously not going to be able to deal with all of those issues. But I want to use an illustration I've used before. I've got some pictures for you, too. Um, if you know anything about the redwood trees in California, uh, northern California primarily, they are absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. Aaron, maybe you can uh, pull up, uh, uh, go to the next picture. I'll, I'll come back to that one. If you look at the, the picture there on the my right, your left, that is a redwood tree. So there's two people hugging it. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these trees. Uh, they've actually um, bored holes uh, in these trees and put uh, roads going through the trees uh, where cars can drive through the trees. These trees are massive trees. Some of them, they're actually considered the tallest trees in the world. Some of them are over 300 feet high. And when you think about the redwood, and, and I've used this illustration before, if you don't remember, that's okay, I'll remind you. You would think that they would have this super deep root system, but they don't. If you look to the picture on your right, you see why these redwoods are so strong and so stable because they are rooted together. And I want you to take a good look at that, because that is, should be, 
a picture of the church. Amen. Just take a good look at it. If you're struggling, if you feel like you're sailing in the wind a bit, if you're watching, you feel like you're sailing in the wind a bit, if you're sitting here, then this might be the issue. Is you're not rooted, you're not connected. Uh, go back to the picture before. And this kind of gives you an idea. They, they've done this kind of overlay. Gives you an idea that uh, there are some that go deeper than others, but more than anything, they are interlocking. They are finding each other, and they're, they're locking their root system so that they can sustain uh, one another. And in essence, what this speaks to us is that they need one another to survive. You know, my son and I were talking about the church, and, you know, I've been pastoring a lot longer than him, although he's been, you know, he's like 33, he's been pastoring like 10 years already. So, uh, you know, we were talking about the church and the value of the church. You know, the value, is it worth fighting for anymore? You know, we were we were talking uh, about this. What whatever happened to fighting for the church? And you know, we we know, and again, we we get it. You know, as pastors, we get it that the church probably the face of the church isn't going to look like it's always looked. Uh, you know, I told him. You know, I don't know if I uh, heard. <clears throat> excuse me. Read this article. Some time ago, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know if Kim read it to me, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but, you know, maybe, you know, I was talking to him that maybe the days of the mega church are over. Yeah. You know, maybe the days of, you know, meeting together and gathering hundreds and hundreds. Because, you know, you know, as pastors, I don't know whether you know this or not, but as pastors, we like people to come to church. And we like people to get saved and come to know Jesus and then come to church. I don't know if you know that or not. You know, uh, if you look around, you know, you might know churches like Bible Center. You know, they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, you know, when that pastor started that church, he didn't just want to build a building and keep it empty. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so Adam and I are talking and we're saying maybe... God is shifting us into a different direction. But there must be value. What will cause people to value gathering together and meeting together as, um, as a people of God? So we're headed into a new year, and, and even though church life is different and looks different than it ever has before for most of us, as the past nine months has been an interesting season, I still believe that we must maintain our roots. And I want you to stay with me because this is not a sermon on coming to church. Why would I preach a sermon on coming to church to people who are coming to church? <laughs> I used to do that. But I do want to talk to you about the, the importance of staying rooted in the will of God. Right. Now, I've always believed that coming to church is the will of God. I've always believed that that was part of it. It wasn't the whole, right? Just kind of a piece of the pie. Coming to church, fellowshipping, you know, getting to know each other, you know, again, linking our roots together, helping each other stand and make it, etc. But the bigger piece of the pie uh, is staying rooted in the will of God. How important is it to stay in the will of God? How important is it to know the will of God? Folks, I am so passionate about this. I'm more passionate about you and I staying in the will of God than I am about you staying in this church. 
I am so passionate about being personally in the will of God. And the will of God seems to be so casual today. I'll just do this and I'll do that. And if I don't want to come, I won't. And if I want to move, I will. And if I want to quit that job, I will. If I don't want to be married anymore, I won't. If I want to date them, I will. I mean, it is like, what is the will of God? Does it matter any longer? Is there anything sacred about the will of God any longer? How important is it to be in the will of God? How important is it to not allow others to determine what the will of God is for our lives? <clears throat> Matthew tw uh, chapter 7, verse 21. It's an incredible verse of Scripture. I can't always get my head around this verse. But I do get my head around what he says at the end. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That, again, for me, is very troubling. Yeah. Because a lot of people feel like that's all I got to do. All I got to do is say, Jesus, Jesus, help me, save me, and I'm good to go. Well, I just want to tell you that this is Jesus speaking. Right, that is. Amen. Amen. And he says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Amen. Maybe that didn't quite read well to you. I'll read it in hillbilly vernacular. <laughs> Only those who do what God says to do will get to go to heaven. Right. Let, me, let me read it a little simpler. Only those who do what God says to do for their life right. will enter. It's not about you doing my will. Nope. It's not about you doing your husband's will. Your boss's will. Your wife's will. They cannot determine the will of God for your life. You know, this is one of the conflicts that people have in marriage. Well, aren't I supposed to submit to my husband? Yeah, but it doesn't mean you're not a child of God anymore. It doesn't mean you don't have a will of God for your life anymore. My wife has a will of God for her life. Ah, yes, I'm the priest of the home. That's what the Bible says. By the way, I know I need to, in 2021, preach more on marriage and the order of marriage and raising children, which I plan on doing. Uh, so if you didn't know it, the Bible says that the husband is the priest of the home, but it is not a home of slavery. It is a home of servitude where we are serving one another in the will of God. Yes. How important is it to pray? And here's the thing is now we do things uh, that we don't even pray about. Uh -oh. And we just say it's the will of God. It's just the will of God for my life. It's just what we're doing. And you know, the thing is, is that as pastors, my wife and I have learned through the years. I didn't know, I didn't learn this until, <laughs> until I probably hurt more people than I wanted to. Not to overreach. Because you have to hear from God for your life. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you have to pray. God, what is your will for my life, for my family, for my children, for my church? We do things and we act ways and we respond and we, do, we, we don't do things as well that we, we don't even really consider in prayer. 
We just make moves as though God's going to bless it. So my question is, who or what are you rooted to? Because whatever, who, who's ever will you're obeying is who you are rooted to. Yeah. Very whatever will you are obeying is who you are rooted to. And if they fall, you do. You, who said that? No. You guys want to finish my sermon this morning. I got it on both sides, man. You will too. And, and I'm, you know, and it's not like I'm prophesying. It's just real. That's why the safe place for you and for me is not that my roots would be buried in Kim, though our roots are together. I am rooted in his will. And if I ever stand up here and say, it is not the will of God for me to be married, please slap me. <laughs> I've heard pastors say that. I've heard pastors say, you know, I, I, thousands of people in their congregations. Yeah. It's not the will of God. He spoke to me. It's not his will for me to be married. Yeah. It's his will for me to minister. Mm -hmm. Listen, bro, you don't have marriage. You don't have ministry. I mean, that's what the Bible says anyway. I don't think you ever made go, what? I can't believe that, Pastor. How do you say that? Well, the Bible says <laughs> that you should be the husband of one wife. The Bible says if you cannot rule your household well, how can you even think about ruling the house of God? Right. You can't. You can't stay committed to the most precious one in this earthly life, and yet you're going to stay committed to people who don't like you half the time? Yeah. Hey, man, the will of God is everything. The will of God is everything. Jesus spells it out in Matthew 20, 7, 21. Hey, listen, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into heaven, but only those who do the will of the Father are going to enter into heaven. Right. Only those who do the will of the Father. Can, are we, can we grasp that? Only those who do the will of the... Don't get hung up on, what do you mean that all those who say, Lord, Lord, won't enter? Don't worry about that. Because you and I have already said, Lord, Lord. Amen? So the, the bottom line is, is now the will of the Father comes to light. Right. Yeah. And we need to root our lives... In his will. I learned how important my own personal root system was as a young believer. Uh, one of my favorite preachers and men that I admired was caught in an inappropriate relationship in probably 1989 or so, maybe 88, somewhere in there. And I looked around at so many people who were literally, folks, literally walking away from God because this man fell into sin. You might think that's strange, but it's not. This is something that happens all too often. And I, I just I realized as a young Christian, what am I rooted in? Where are my roots? Am I going to be shaken every time something doesn't line up with the way that I want it to line up? Every time my world uh, is, is shattered, every time I'm disappointed, every time someone offends me, every time someone speaks negative about my life, am I going to be rocked? Is my world going to be shaken and my, and, and my faith in God going to be questioned? Because this is what happened. And as a young man, I looked around, and I thought, I am not walking away from God because of this man's failure. I made a decision that, I would, that no one, no one, absolutely no one was worth going to hell over. No one. That's so true. 
Just made a decision. I, well, you know, it was, it was probably deep revelation to me then. I was like, wow, you know, that's so good, man. <laughs> I probably said it to people who were like, yeah, duh, dummy. But for me, that was deep. It was like nobody is worth going to hell over. And Jesus said, only those who do the will of my Father will enter into heaven. And so what it did is it caused me to examine my own roots and where, what they were planted into. Throughout this year of the pandemic, there has been a, uh, maybe I'll call it a root exposure. <laughs> Amen. There has been a root exposure. People who thought that they were rooted firmly in the will of God were now making decisions without even considering the will of God. Y'all can say amen or amen. They were so caught off guard by what was happening around them and what was being said that their roots were exposed. There was an exposure of their roots. Jeremiah 17. Verse 7 and 8. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. Amen. They are like trees planted along the riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered. Love that. They're not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought, their leaves stay healthy. And they never stop producing fruit. This is what it is to be rooted. This is what it is to be rooted in the will of God. It's what it is to be rooted not in the will of man, not in the will of, of climate, not in the will of what, what's happening around us. And you see it here in this text in Jeremiah, that trees that are rooted in the water, they're not worried about the heat. Why? Because they're rooted in the water. They're not worried about months of drought. They're not worried about months and months of drought or no water. Why? Because they're getting their water. Right. Their water is the will of God. Right. And they're staying rooted. They're staying planted. That's right. it's true. My concern uh, from the very beginning of this pandemic was the health of the church. Right. That was my concern. Yeah. Are we going to stay healthy? I felt smaller churches would be impacted the most. Larger churches, of course, everyone felt it. And I don't know whether that's played out to be the case or not. Uh, but I do know that my concern was the health of the church. The health of the people. The, pe the church obviously isn't the building. And I, keep, you know, I wasn't here painting the building, making sure the walls didn't crack. <laughs> You know, right. well, what are you concerned about the building? No, I was concerned about the people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Concerned about the health of the people. Yeah. And people that stay rooted in the will of God, that pray, actually pray. You know, I had people come into our church during that time, and they said, you know, we, we were praying and felt like this is where God wanted us to come. This is where he wanted, even though they go to another church, they want, they came here. This is because they pray. When you pray, God will speak to you. His will is critical to our health. Many times when people aren't healthy, it's, it's not the church's fault. Right. 
You know, and sometimes it's not even their own, like, knowledge fault. It's just they were rooted in the wrong place. They were rooted in something different than the will of God. Are you with me so far? I, I'm about done, but they were they they were rooted. They had their roots maybe in how they felt when they came to church, and then when they didn't feel good about it, they didn't come anymore. They 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 were rooted in the wrong thing. The will of God has to be on the front of our minds. The will of God has to be. It can't just be whatever I want to do, whatever I'm supposed to do, whatever I think I should do. God, what do you want me to do? And I feel so bad about people who are, I don't feel bad about people who are missing church. Church doesn't save you. Church keeps you saved in some ways. It keeps the word fresh in you. But I feel more more bad about people who miss the will of God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is true, inevitably, you will, you will see the two coincide. Yeah. The house of God and the will of God. You'll see them coincide. They do. They collide. Because yeah. the gathering of people is, 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 match, is, is, is helping us line up with the will of God for our lives. Listen, this was always God's plan. You know, when the church was started, you know, in the book of Acts, I mean, it was so hard, Chance. You should read the book of Acts, A-C-T-S. You should read it now, too, the book of Acts. It'll really help you to understand the church. When the church was started, you know, the, the senior pastor got his head cut off. It wasn't like, let's all go to church, yay! It was like, well, you know, yeah, if you want to risk your life, maybe. But see, persecution came, and what happened in persecution is the church grew. Because now people begin to value one another. See, that's, I'm trying to frame this. I mean, I mean, I'm even thinking about it today as I'm finishing this up and going over some notes and, and thinking about this in a prayer room, that what is this gathering all about anyway? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I preached on the Sunday night, if you were here, you know, just real short that, you know, where two or three are gathered together, I am in their midst. And so, you know, I begin to think, well, aren't you in my midst if I'm not gathered with anybody? Are you not, like, not with me? You're in my midst if I'm, right? But where two or three, there's a greater presence. There's a greater awareness. There's something deeper that God does in the gathering. You know, I'm really done with people saying this is not essential. Because it is essential to God that his body, (laughs) just like your body, you know, Caleb's back there, you know, Caleb didn't like take his arm off and leave it at the house today. (laughs) Hey, Chloe, can you like cut my leg off and leave it at home and I'll just, you know, no, he's got his whole body here. God gives us this picture so that we can understand it in those simple terms that we are the body. And so this is essential to what God is wanting to do on the earth today. And we have to value this. We have to value. I, I do not get my mandate from somebody that says this is not essential. I don't care what they say. I don't listen. Yeah. Don't the miss noise. Yeah. Right. Listen, folks, listen. It is the government has no say over the church. Right. They never have. It has always been two separate entities throughout history. The government has never had a say 
on what goes on in the sanctuary of God. This has always been different. It's in our constitution. It's always been different. Always. God placed pastors, apostles, evangelists, preachers, teachers yeah. over the house of God yeah. Amen. so that we could come into the unity of the faith with one another. That has always been God's mandate. Yeah. See, what is his will? His will for us to be rooted in his will. Being planted and rooted in the will of God is intentional. It is absolutely not just going to happen. It is going to be intentional. It's going to be something that you do on purpose. And I'm telling you, not because you hear somebody preach about it or somebody encourages you, hey, get in the will of God, brother, yes, sister, get in the will of God. That's not going to happen. It is going to be you intentionally sitting down by yourself saying, God, I need to know from you, what is your will for my life? See, Jeremiah 17, 7 says, but... Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. These, this is the root system of every believer, that God is our trust, he is our hope, he is our confidence. That's what nourishes our lives. You know, and when we begin... When we when our leaves stay green, and that's always the that's always the, the sign of health, is that the leaves are green and producing fruit. When we are able to do that in difficult seasons like we've been in, when the church is able to stay positive, to stay joyful, to stay healthy, to stay fruitful, listen, that becomes contagious. But when we join the voices of complaint or political complaint with everybody else, that's not contagious. Then you're just like everybody else. See, we are called to be separate. That is just what the Bible says. We are called to be separate. See, we need to have a contagious life. And what's contagious, what I see, uh, you know, even as myself looking on i'm interested in pastors who are believing god and not giving in mm -hmm. it's just what i'm interested in yeah. pastors that are believing god for the unbelievable right. believing god for the supernatural not giving in to the to the things that are happening around us yes, see that to me becomes contagious what do you think about when you think about the word contagious? I know exactly what you think about. You think about COVID-19, man. It's contagious, man. Yes, it is. There is a negative side of contagion. But there's also a very powerful side of contagion. That Jesus wants his church to be contagious. And Jeremiah gives us this revelation of being rooted in the will of God. I believe that the water is the will. The water is his will. I am planted by streams of living water. I am planted in his will. I am not moved by the drought of summer. I am not moved by the heat of the day. I am not moved when the winds. I want to be a tree. That cannot be moved. Yeah. That will not be shaken. Yeah. Whose leaves are green and producing fruit. I, I want to be that tree. Yeah. I want to be contagious. Mm -hmm. In the good way. Yeah. You know, I was reading a, there's a great book. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote a book called Tipping Point, if you've read it. He, he uses this illustration, gang warfare. He, he, he he says, 
Gang warfare was at an all-time high in neighborhoods in New York in the 80s and 90s. He said when the sun went down, nobody walked the streets. Nobody would go to the parks. The police would come out nonstop, calls of crimes that were unthinkable. In 1992, there were 2,100 murders in New York City. One year, 1992, 2,100 murders in New York City. They said there were over 600,000 serious crimes in one year. But at some point, something changed. Wasn't anything noticeable. Malcolm Gladwell's writing this. He said the way we know something changed is by 1997, there was no longer 2,100 murders, there were 770. And instead of there being over 600,000 serious crimes, there was just under 300,000. As quickly as crime rose, it dropped. What happened? He says these words, somehow a large number of people got infected with an anti-crime virus. <laughs> and so I thought about that. How about if the church would get infected with an I'm going to tell people about Jesus virus. Amen. I'm going to tell people about the love of God virus. Yeah. I'm going to be faithful to the will of God virus. I'm not going to back down or retreat or regret what God's done in my life virus. You know, D.L. Moody made a statement years ago, stuck with me. I heard this when I was in Bible college in the 80s. He said, the world has yet to see what will become of a man who is fully surrendered to God. I want to be that man. You know, there's a lot of questions that pastors have. Whatever happened to? Whatever happened to valuing the people of God? Whatever happened to tears on the altar? Whatever happened to repentance from sin? There's a lot of sermons that are preached these days that are that come with that title, Whatever Happened to? Two. Well, let's think of whatever happened to just do the will of God. Right. Just ask the Lord, what is your will for my life? And then do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. Wait for him to answer. Mm. Yeah. Don't get ready to do something and go, Lord, whatever happened to your, I'm, thank you, I'm, I'm just going to do what I want to do. That's too many times how we approach the will of God with something already in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I read an interesting book, and um, it, it just talks about little things making a difference. You know, like D.L. Moody, wanting to be that man who would bring the gospel to his generation. And here's a man, D.L. Moody, he had no motorized vehicles, he had no airplanes. He was traveling on horseback and traveling on ships over the sea. And D.L. Moody, in his lifetime, it was said, uh, preached to over one million people. Thinking, Lord, what have I done? I've got FaceTime Live, or whatever it's called. Facebook time, whatever, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, we've got Instagram, we've got YouTube, we've got airplanes, we've got everything we need. But what are we doing? Right. Yeah. The will of God must be at the, at the front of our prayers. Right. And this is why Jesus said to pray, your will be done right. on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. How are we contending in our generation? I don't know how much I can read. I've got to close. 1958, David Wilkerson. If you don't know who David Wilkerson is, just look him up. Write it down, look him up. 1958, David Wilkerson was reading Life magazine. 
He turned a page and he saw a picture of seven boys, seven young boys uh, in New York City. These boys were on trial in Manhattan for murder. They murdered a 15-year-old boy. These seven young boys were on trial for murder. They were all part of different gangs, the Egyptian kings, the jesters, the dragons, all of these gangs were, and many, many more in New York at the time. He said that while he was looking at this picture, the Holy Spirit moved on him with compassion. And he began to weep. Think about this. There's a young preacher. His dad was the president or the uh, district supervisor of the Assemblies of God in, in Pennsylvania. That's where David Wilkerson's from. Mm -hmm. And David Wilkerson, a young man reading Time magazine, sees a picture of seven gang members who had just murdered a young boy. And he's looking at this picture, and in his own words, the Holy Spirit moved on me with compassion, and he began to weep. David Wilkerson drove to New York City. You can read this on your own time. He drove to New York City. He actually went to the court hearing of the seven young boys. And the judge at the end asked if there was anybody that had anything to say. David Wilkerson sprang to his feet. He approached the judge. And at that time, they didn't know if he was going to shoot the judge or if he was part of the gang. They didn't know. So the bailiffs tackle him, drag him out of the courtroom. And all he's doing is saying, judge, I want to pray for these young boys. David Wilkerson was so discouraged. He went home, but he was compelled, so compelled that he got in his car the next week with his youth pastor, Miles Hoover, and he drove to the court hearing. He wanted to talk to them. What the newspapers did is they snapped a picture of David Wilkerson being dragged out of the courtroom. I'm going to finish with this. And it's funny, the, and I saw some old pictures of this. His picture yeah. was put up all over the city. And he was walking around in some of these ghetto areas in Manhattan. And some of the gangs were coming out. And they recognized him. Mm -hmm. And they called him Preach. Mm -hmm. They said, hey, Preach, you're one of us now. And David Wilkerson used that as an inroad to start a ministry called Teen Challenge, which has ministered to millions of people, still is today. He began his church there in Times Square, New York. He, was, he just died a number of years ago. But it, a few weeks after this courtroom adventure, he was asked, to do a two-week youth revival where over 5,000 teenagers came to hear him speak. Mm -hmm. This was the very opposite of how he thought it would happen. Mm -hmm. He had no idea. All he knew was that God had inspired him and he wanted to do the will of God. Right. He prayed and he responded to the will of God. It may not be how you line it up. It may not happen how you had it planned. But if you will stay rooted in. You know, West Virginia is an amazing place. Mm -hmm. I just wish everyone else would see it that way. It is a beautiful place. Yeah. God loves West Virginia. God is breathing revival on this state. Amen. All over the place, people are getting saved. People are being touched. And I want to encourage you, find your roots. Where are they? Where are they at? Are they rooted into his will? Listen, don't root them into 
a girlfriend or a job or or a denomination or some way of thinking root them into his will and you will stay fruitful and your life will become contagious we are still called to disciple culture it's what we're called to do and i pray that each of us that come into this assembly would find the will of god and would move in that and not be ashamed of it not be ashamed of the will of god for your life and so you know i just encourage you you know again we'll have an altar call and all that but a lot of this needs to be done on your own prayer time your own time with god where you're praying lord i want your will and listen if you need you know, if you need somebody to pray with you, then ask somebody to pray with you regarding the will of God. So, uh, anyway, listen, I'm done uh, because there's so much to be uh, talked about regarding the root of our lives and where our roots are. And so I want to encourage you tonight as we close uh, that you would just take a quick look tonight. I don't know, maybe it won't, maybe it won't be too hard for you. To see the root of your life. Where is it? Is it is it in something that is shifting? An emotion that is, you know what I'm saying? Is it in something that's, you know, I know, you know, anyway. So I'm just going to leave that there. And I want us to pray uh, tonight. Hopefully this uh, somehow ministered, made sense to you. Because I want to pray. Because this, to me this is so important. The root cause. The root. The root is the cause. Of so many things in our lives. And so I want us to pray tonight. I want you to bow your heads with me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Amen. Maybe uh, you don't know Jesus. Listen, this is the most important decision you will ever make in your life to give Jesus your heart. It's the beginning. I mean, as you as we read tonight, saying Lord, Lord, and asking Him into our lives, that is not the end of it. It is once we give Him our lives. Then the journey begins. Lord, what is your will for my life? What is your purpose? What is your plan? You know, this is the only way my wife and I ever were able to understand that we were called to go into ministry full time and pioneer and pastor and travel and do what we do because we prayed. Lord, we want your will for our lives. And maybe you're in this place and you've never asked Jesus. That is the beginning place for his will for you, is that you would give him your life. And I want you to let me pray with you, if you will. Lift your hand all over this place. Say, yes, I want to ask Jesus in my life. Lift your hand with me just very quickly. Maybe you need to rededicate your life to him. Would you just say yes to him? I want to pray with you. Just slip your hand up so I can see it. Maybe you're watching online here. God bless you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anyone else quickly, you slip your hand up. Listen, this is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. Who is going to be the master of your life? Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else quickly before we do anything else? You lifted your hand. I want you to look at me. Can I pray with you? I want you just to come. Babe, if I could have you come and help me pray. God bless you. Thank you. I want you to say this with me. Say, Jesus, thank you that you love me and you never gave up on me. I ask you to forgive me and live in my heart all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, I pray you would bless let there be a cleansing. Thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. God, let her feel the warmth of your grace and love. God flooding over her soul right now, over her life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just pray for her. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So what a wonderful presence of God here tonight in this place and 
I want to just open the altars uh, tonight and maybe you would just have a moment to just examine the root and maybe maybe you've wondered why am I so shifty in this why am I why do I not feel the stability that I should feel why do I why do I feel so up and down at times and listen maybe there's just a root issue maybe you just need to examine where your roots are planted and God I want to plant these roots in your will period period your will I want my roots planted in your will so we're going to pray tonight and maybe God's dealing with you you come find a place to pray as we worship here tonight the Lord bless you thank you Lord thank you Father thank you Lord we give you praise and glory thank you Lord Thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. You bless. Let him minister to you tonight.